Hi, thank you for joining us. This is Origins of Behavior and I'm your presenter, Kate Wilson. This lecture was put together to really dive into what behavior's function is in an animal, where it comes from, and then to look at some of the things that influence it. And then lastly, give us an idea of how we can adjust some of those factors so that we're getting the best out of the dogs that we take in to rescue or that you adopt. So we're gonna break this down into three areas. One is the role of behavior. So a look at the evolution of behavior, what it was created for, what, it, um, what kind of things it can do developmental stages, the natural stages the animals go through that might make them more resilient or faster to pick up on certain types of information. And then the last section will be the influence of genetics and how those um, impact the behavior. And we'll have another look at genetics and epigenetics is the last section. And that is some of the newest information that we have in regards to how epigenetics influence the individual over their lifetime and how some aspects of epigenetics um, also will affect the offspring of that individual over time. So the role of behavior, we'll say the three areas are optimizing success, predation and prey competition, and reproduction. So behavior didn't have a very um, intense purpose until there was movement. And there really began to be movement as animals went from sort of sedentary um, organisms that were kind of at the whim of the environment to needing to move to locate resources. In order to move to locate resources, you need senses to know where the resources are in space. So this is down to single celled organisms. They are not quite to the level where they would be able to have neurons. That's its, its own cell. So they had to be able to form multiple cells that were together, and then those needed senses, and then those needed motion. In order for the brain to develop, it's thought that it probably developed somehow from the very early neurons that were involved in movement, and that's motor neurons, things that were um, used for locomotion, but if you can connect them in certain ways that they could maybe store information. So very early on, there started to be these little buds and they would sort of maybe store information on ways to move your body so that you didn't have to learn from scratch every single time. So that's, that's sort of the origin, what's thought now to sort of be how the, the brains that we have now originally developed. They had sort of a very, um, humble beginnings as um, motor neurons probably. So let's say as you start to do this, you have organisms that are now able to record certain motor patterns, certain ways to move in the environment. They could probably pass on some of those ways to move in the environment to the point where we are now um, where babies learn to crawl, babies learn to walk, puppies learn to walk, they learn to move. Some of that is of information they're taking from the environment. And some of that is they, are, they already have some of those instructions and they just need a little bit of feedback from the environment in order to implement those instructions. So as they were moving in their environment, there, be, there is another need, which is to process and remember where things are. So if you find food or if you find a predator, Loc remembering those locations is, is either safe or as dangerous, there became a selective advantage to individuals who could do this. So uh, that's sort of the origin of what it was for. And it gives, it's nice to go back to its basic units because when you're looking at where we are now, um, you just see that it's really m alterations of that very, um, very simple formula that was needed to move in the world. Um, so the next thing that happened for them is they, is animals went from, let's say if you're just, you're just harnessing the sun, you're just feeding off of things that have already died to, to actually pursuing prey, or if you're prey to avoiding a predator. So in order to find prey, as we start to go up in time after life has been created, you start having animals that need to use their senses to find prey. And then we have prey learning how to avoid predators. So smelling predators, being able to 
um, run away in time, to be able to stay alert to their environment in some manner. And this began to sort of shape our predator-prey relationships. And that's not the only thing that was shaping this organism, but it's something that has been looked at in science because it was of interest to the people who study animals, um, was how predators and prey are different and how they're similar. So this relationship, which can be thought of as competition over the prey's body, the prey obviously wants to keep their body, but the predator does too. And so it's one of the, the early competitions that existed in this world was the competition over that particular resource. And this led to another group of behavior pa patterns developing, which is when you see, when you feel something dangerous to turn on your escape, your avoidance to get away from a predator. And it turned on the predatory behaviors in the predator animal. So if you see something that fits this criteria, turn on your, I'm a predator, I'm going to catch and eat you because you, that is necessary for survival. It has to be practiced by most predators once a day, once every other day, at most once a week. They really need to be able to take down game quite frequently and continuously during their lifetime in order to um, survive. So as things get more complicated in that regard and fine-tuned, there's also a level of communication that has developed between predators and prey, where a predator has certain communications that they will do to their prey, and the prey will communicate back to the predator about their fitness. And the real purpose of it is to try to dissuade the predator from wasting their time. So some animals will, like a white-tailed deer maybe, will jump really high. They will warn everyone in the group to run at the same time. Um, there's things that began to develop to make their survival more likely. And as this, these became more and more complicated, you need a brain to process all of that information. You need to decide when is it more advantageous for me to communicate to my entire group? Um, who in my group communicates to me? Are they honest in their communication? Some animals are not honest. Some animals will pretend they saw a predator in order to get access to food or mates. Um, Others are continuously honest in how they communicate that information. And so you get animals that um, have to store that information in order to make assessments about how they will proceed. And then another huge kind of cornerstone to what behavior is for, if an organism is unable to reproduce, then all of the genetic material that they have is lost in that generation so that they they specifically have. So it doesn't mean related, they could still help, uh, help a related partner and they could get some information that they shared with someone to the next generation. And that does have a role in what is passed on into the future, but their particular line and their particular uniqueness will be lost. So locating mates and then optimizing your offspring survival while maximizing the number of offspring that you can produce in your life became a very important um, calculation for animals to make. And those calculations have to be kept in the brain. You can't leave it up to chance um, because somebody who has better processing power um, based on whatever environment they're in will outcompete you. So that's another evolutionary pressure that sort of shaped the very early stages. And again, that's very a very simple, very um, kind of, uh, elementary way to look at what form behavior and it's not the only things that were influencing behavior but it's a few things just to get you started thinking about what is behavior really for why do we have it we don't just have it so we can sit down and read a book all of these things have a deeper root and then they have precipitated so that we can we can do things like sit down and read a book so the next step will be developmental stages so we'll have a look at learning theory the stages of puppy development, and then things that you might be able to do to change the odds based on where you have your puppy, what behaviors you see in your puppy, and the age that they come into the rescue or into your home or shelter. So in learning theory, we're really going to spend most of our time looking at sensitivity experience, uh, experiments and then ongoing experience that occurs within the animal. And this was a little turkey, um, a little wild turkey that um, we imprinted at the Creature Conservancy so that it could be an ambassador animal. And um, he spent some of his early life at my house and was 
was um it was interesting because of the age the age and the development that you could see as he kind of progressed um and and that really um for me kind of um brought me back to the early stuff that conrad conrad lorenz had worked on so some of the things that he had a look at was why do birds imprint and here's a picture of some geese following um, a person and what happens is they have this window where it's extremely important that they imprint on something large and that's moving if you don't imprint and you don't follow around your parent chances of survival are virtually zero for an animal who doesn't because you can't make your way in the world by yourself you can't survive a cold night if you can't snuggle up to something and so there's a very intense um, need for them to um, bond in that way so he looked a lot of imprinting and then and the stages that those things happen and it's not in the beginning it was sort of thought like it was a very strict critical period that they had to be exposed to but that word critical has really been taken out and turned into sensitive and sensitive is a bit more appropriate because these things often don't change like on the dot at midnight they are slight variations between individuals and then there's how sticky sort of the brain is for that information during that time in order for those neurons to develop they have to have some kind type of input. So if you take a chick and you raise it in isolation and it never sees a big um, moving target during its, its critical or its sensitive period, then it passes that period. And then it becomes more difficult for them to bond to a larger moving target after that. So maybe for the turkeys, I saw that five days after they hatched, you had to work a lot harder in order to become what would be a parental figure for them. Um, but if you were there for the first 24 hours, it would last more intensely and those nerves would, those neurons would sort of develop. And probably what's happening is that those neurons are primed for that stimuli. And if they don't get the stimuli, then they start to be pruned back where other neurons can take over. So things like vision are also one of these things. You need to be able to see light and you need to be able to see vertical or horizontal lines in order for things like kittens to develop normally. If for some reason they can't see in the very beginning of life, then their brains don't develop normally because they needed that input in order to develop that part of the brain. And so I've had a dogs come in. Um, I had a puppy one time who came in who um, the owners were like, we're having these issues with this puppy where he's mouthing, he's bumping into walls, he's knocking over furniture, he's running into people. Um, and so they were really there to work on what their problems were with the puppy. When the puppy walked in the door, it was apparent immediately that the puppy was blind. And so I asked, how long has he been blind? And they were astounded that he could be blind it never occurred to them so going back and and finding out what the history was with this puppy this puppy had been raised in someone's basement sort of in a hoarding situation in the dark and probably what happened is his eyes were perfectly normal it was a little brindle puppy um, and the eyes probably developed perfectly normal but because it never had the input stimuli that means that the centers for vision never developed in the puppy's brain and so you can't get that back if that's something that was lost so the definition for the sensitive period is it's being very sensitive to a certain stimuli so um, so for the birds it's the visual appearance of a very large moving object for even baby birds inside their egg it's the sound of maybe their parents because the babies are already vocalizing in the egg before they even hatch and the the essence thing to take away from this is these windows are not slam shut on midnight they're a little bit more sticky and in our different breeds of dogs we have variations so the german shepherds variation may be that their windows shut sooner where things maybe like some of the labs their windows might be open longer um, and that change is fairly easy that would be a smaller sort of um, an aspect that we would be able to control genetically just when do you shut this window when do you turn on um, other other sort of chemicals that might make you more sensitive to fear for example um, and what that does is it has a long lasting impact on that animal. So maybe a wolf has a very short period 
And so they are suspicious of strangers much longer. If you double that, you get something more like the dog. So they have had way more positive experiences and their brain now is on a different trajectory than um, a dog or a wolf who had a very short window. The thing about the learning stages is that different times are going to be more sensitive to certain types of stimuli. So we talked about the vision you need to be able to see things during a certain time in your life, depending on what kind of animal you are. And the same thing with your, with your hearing, you need to be able to hear things. Remember, most birds, most animals are already hearing things. Those things are already developed before they're born or before they hatch. So some of those senses are already starting to be used. Um, some of that um, in the puppy and in humans, you can start to have imprinting on certain types of food that they will eat for the rest of their life because their parents ate them. So that uh, really what happened is that we saw in studies, people from different areas were really liked certain types of foods and had a preference for certain flavors. And that's not something that when it was looked into that was genetic, the real thing that was happening here was that the parents had eaten the food in that culture. And so the babies in utero were exposed to those foods and that is when they developed their preference. So if your mom ate it, it must be food. And so they have a preference for selecting that type of food. If you go somewhere else, if you were, didn't have that type of food, it has nothing to do with genetics of the parent. It was exposure in utero, which really developed their taste for what things they like. So it's not just the developmental stages. There has to be this ongoing experience to maintain behavior. So if you lose something, you, your brain will start to um, kind of reclaim those neurons. If you get a toe amputated, what will happen is the surrounding parts of your brain will start to take over the empty, the neurons that were not, no longer being used, and it will change your perception. So let's say if you had a finger cut off, um, your index finger, your body and your brain would start to take over the neurons and pretty soon the sensation that was that finger will now be within your thumb and your middle finger. Because what happens is that the mapping kind of tells it where it is in space, but the associations of what's actually being used for will be the other two fingers. So it's very interesting and important for us to remember that these are not set in stone, that these animals are not just formed in their adolescence and then they are done learning. The thing about behavior is it's really designed to carry an animal from pre-birth all the way until the end of life. And it is this extra tool that's needed to adapt to the world to be able to optimize your success. So the, the, um, so it's important to remember there has to be some maintenance of those things. Otherwise, the responses will start to, to shift. And um, a lot of factors influence how those things might shift. So the role of learning in that are these, these basic rules of how the world has shaped our brains to optimize our success. So there's certain rules that's, that have become important enough that all animals share that association. The basis is that if you do a behavior and um, for non-associative learning, if you, do a, if you do a behavior in a response to a stimuli, what type of stimuli was it? Is it a harmful stimuli or is it, does it mean nothing? And that's habituation and sensitization. So both of those go either way. And sensitizing happens much faster and, and um, is much more difficult to get rid of after you've been sensitized. Um, habituation, it's fairly easy to shake someone out of habituation and get them sensitized again. But once you're sensitized, animals are overwhelmingly designed to look for the dark side of life. And so if there is something that's happening that's unpleasant, they record that and that memory is very hard, if not impossible to extinguish. And that's actually not known if you can extinguish it. Um, associative learning is, is what we kind of think of as training your dog or um, early experiments where you're forming associations with things. And that's the associative and um, 
operant classical is in the associative learning. So that's really an association between some kind of stimuli, whether your behavior drives it or you physiologically respond to it is sort of the idea there. Both of those things in associative learning are never happening apart from each other. So with desensitization, you sort of have this area where you're not reacting to it. You've been desensitized to that stimuli. You can progress from that level to the green over here, which is, I love that stimuli, or you can go the other way, which I'm very, very sensitive or fearful to that stimuli. So a lot of times if we're doing a desensitization procedure with our puppies, we combine it with counter conditioning to give us this little buffer region where I can get the animal up to loves. If I don't do that, and let's say I just put the, um, a backpack or a harness on a dog, they can become habituated over time. But if you take it off and bring it back, they often will find it aversive because the process of being habituated was unpleasant. And, um, and it's very easy to sensitize them. And that would, if I, if I put it on them and they had to just get used to it and they couldn't get away, they would become accustomed to it. And we get to sort of to neutral at some point why they readjust to this is my new life. Um, but again, the process makes it so that next time I show them the harness, it doesn't, it's not seen as a pleasant thing and they might even find it aversive and move away from it. Uh, just a quick look at the um, associative learning. So we have positive reinforcement up here with the cheetah. Positive reinforcement is that good things, things the animal might find good, and this is sort of subjective here because the technical term would be anything that once it's added increases the behavior, but for us generally, good things are added to increase the behavior. Negative punishment is that I remove good things to reduce the behavior. So I can also punish behavior. If the behavior is not working for the animal, the animal is biologically over billions of years going to reduce that behavior in order to maximize their success. At the same time, you have positive punishment and negative reinforcement, which are two ways to achieve a punishment or a reinforcement of behavior, both of which use something the animal might find aversive or would choose to avoid. So, and these are examples with the big cats because they're, they're another um, animal that they still use a lot of aversives with. And you find that um, the animal will reduce their punishment or they will maintain a behavior, which is sort of an escape behavior, but under a lot of pressure. So that's this guy kissing this lion. If the lion leaves the stage, he takes the whip out. So the lion has to stay centrally located and that behavior is reinforced through negative reinforcement. What happens is that the animals where you're using these red arrows have an emotional side effect because biologically, if you're getting good things, you're doing good in life. If you're getting bad things or you're doing something to avoid a bad thing, then a different system kicks on in the animal, which says you're not in a great place in life. And so they start to have signs of stress and aggression very frequently with that type of training. So here's our developmental stages. We have one through six. Um, sometimes these are grouped together in different ways. Uh, the neonatal and the transitional period can be grouped together because really transitional period is like a week where the little puppy slugs are trying to walk. Um, neonatal is they are still just totally these little helpless, blind um, things that can barely find their mother. Um, they still have olfactory abilities, so they can locate those things and they can pick up on pheromones and that type of stuff. So let's start with the first one is your prenatal period. It was once thought that not much was happening during this time, but now we know that quite a bit is happening in humans and in other mammals, and that during this period, what happens to the mother and how stressed she is will affect all of those little skeletons inside there. The next stage is they're actually born, and now we start to have environmental influence like are they being um, held by people? Do they smell people? Are they being cared for by their mother? And that means licked and groomed and taken care of um, really babied intensely. The more mothering and the more kind of nurturing they get during the stage, the more resilient they will be as adults. And this is one, we'll talk about it later, but this is one of the ways there's a feedback system to help the animal adjust to what could be their future environment. Then we have the transition period. 
And the transition period gets us away from helpless and gets us to actual moving. And once they can move, you start your socialization period. And that period is one of the ones I talked about, which is not necessarily closed as it maybe was once thought at like 12 weeks or 16 weeks, but individuals and individual lines of dogs have variation in how long it takes for that to truly sort of be completed, that period. So if you do adopt your dog at 16 weeks, and, and that would be, you know, technically the end of the socialization period, for sure, don't stop working to make your dog comfortable with people and strangers. You might have to work a little bit harder, but those windows aren't necessarily just slammed shut again at midnight. Um, so then after we have the socialization period where dogs are learning who is in my social group, who can I communicate with, who are other members of the kind of wider community, um, and that's when they, you want to expose them to other safe dogs. You want to expose them to children, to people of all ages, to, to everything. If I'm, I want to make sure my dog is not afraid of people in wheelchairs. If I'm using crutches, you really want them to recognize that all of those things are safe. And, and not just by watching, I'm going to guarantee it by providing something they really like in those areas. You don't want to set them up to have an exposure that's a fearful exposure because unfortunately those also have a really big impact on how they develop as they age. So the next is we have a juvenile period. And these are also very important times for the dogs. I don't want my dogs, I mean, you never want your dog to be in a dog fight. But during this period, if they're attacked on a walk, they're far more likely to be reactive forever to some degree. You always have to kind of fight this early impression they have that the world is dangerous. So I'm pretty protective over my dogs for their first two years. And then I can loosen my grip a little bit as we figure out more things that we can, that we can do. Maybe I, I allow them to work a little bit with some of their interactions. And, and help them navigate what that means. But I'm very careful with the dogs that you might be exposing the dog to. A dog who gives corrections is not a good dog during this first two year period. Um, and if you happen to live with a dog like that, I train it to mean something. So the dog's like, get out of here. And then your puppy comes to you and it gets a treat. So all of those things will help. You think, well, of course they'll they would figure it out by themselves. The dog gives them a, a snarl or a correction or barks and lunges and they move away and they've, now the dogs are figuring it out the way the dogs figure it out. But if you do that, the risk you run is your dog will become dog aggressive or mimic those behaviors or higher to another dog in a similar situation. So they definitely learn through observation and sometimes the lessons they learn from those interactions are not the ones that we intended to teach them. So our early life, let's look at the prenatal, some of the consequences, and then prevention that we can do after we know that they've been under stress. So we have a pregnant mom here, and then we have a puppy who, was, who really grew up in a, in a um, shelter environment. So when you get the puppy, or when the puppy enters the shelter or rescue, or foster home, or your home, see where they are in their development. Can they walk? Or is that like the most important thing? Do they need to learn how to walk on shiny surfaces and crackly floors and all of this? Or are we more at the stage where the puppy can already do those things? So let's start exposing them to very friendly, calm children. I just wanna know what stage the puppy's in to maximize what I can get from them. It doesn't mean that if the puppy's at the stage where they're ready to socialize, I stop doing things like um, giving them exposure to novel services and new smells, you always will be exposing to that because of the maintenance idea. You really are maintaining behaviors um, throughout their entire life. And these stages, they need to see new places. They need to be comfortable in new places. All dogs are going to be born with a spectrum of how comfortable they are going to novel environments. And we're trying to give them this best version of life, which is whatever your full potential is to be comfortable in a new place, I want you to achieve that. Whatever your full potential to be comfortable meeting children, I want you to do that. So that's what you're really thinking of when you have these guys is to give them this view to shape them biologically to think that life is as good as they could possibly imagine. And therefore, the other behaviors like aggression, reactivity, they're not necessarily going to be needed in this environment, and at least not consistently, because you're in a safe environment. And this is the time when you can change your odds for those things developing. But don't forget, they're always learning. It's not just that you get puppies and you get an older dog and they're done. 
all of my dogs were, four of my dogs were adopted when they were after one and a half, some of them after two years. And obviously they continue to learn throughout that time. They were reactive during that time. They learned other ways to deal with them, with situations, reactivity, and new ways to associate seeing dogs or people. So it's not just, again, it's not just done. You can't, you're not just finished after you get to this point, but realize that you need to enjoy the process of that training because that's where the dog is during that time. If you have an older dog who is still reactive. Um, and then if you have a puppy or really a dog that you've just adopted, or a dog who is showing some reactivity, I don't want them to have another scary experience. So for some dogs, they're a little predisposed. It could be one scary event and they decide that all dogs are scary. I, the younger they are, the more generalized that is because they don't have very many other um, experiences to kind of counterbalance that. Like, oh, but that dog was friendly. They only know three dogs and one was aggressive. That's more than a third of dogs are aggressive from their point. Um, but if you have a six-year-old dog and they've met a hundred dogs and then one was aggressive, they'll probably be like, oh, 20% of dogs are aggressive. That's a little easier for me to kind of push back and redefine as, no, they're actually all safe um, than it might be for a puppy who's had a bad event. So when you're doing this, don't count on luck. You really want to make sure the experiences are good. So if I get this, this, this little individual and I'm working to build an association, you don't just want to desensitize, really push it to they love it. If the dog loves it and there's still some experience later on in life that's slightly fearful, you're not going to jump right down to all the way into that red zone where you say, oh, I'm really scared of that. Um, I'm now associate that with fear. You might just go from, I love it to, eh, it's not that bad. I don't really like it, but it's not terrible. That's a lot easier to, to gain back, to get back into love. Um, so give yourself a buffer. I always bring food. I play, I have fun. I make sure they have safe places. I never push the puppies into something that they don't want to do. I did that with my first dog. I took him everywhere. I exposed him to everything. And he was one of my most reactive dogs because he had to do those things. They were scary for him and he didn't just get used to it. So, and that was sort of normal during that time. 10 years ago, that's kind of what a lot of trainers were doing was bet more exposure, the better you get, you know, a hundred people in a hundred days kind of thing. Um, it is, it is not, a good idea for many dogs. You have to use your particular dog to guide how you do that. If they're having fun and they're relaxed and they're safe, you don't see them pausing, you don't see them unsure, then great, they're doing awesome. If they're unsure, then that means that's the beginning of anxiety. And I don't want them to start feeling and associating the world and new people and new places with anxiety. So that's our stages. So then we have our experience. So how behavior was really designed to interact with the environment. It's supposed to get that organism sort of the maximum level of, of biological fitness, which is that you can get your genes in the next generation. Obviously all of our dogs are neutered or most of them are. And so that's no longer about getting your genes the next generation. However, it's billions of years of scaffolding that behavior to do just that. And so you're still going to be dealing with some of that, those, those very innate laws that kind of govern behavior and how it works. So the organism, the, the, these dogs are really, they have this behavior and it's supposed to help them be environmentally responsive. They need to be able to change to a changing world. That's kind of their last line of defense for to after they've been formed, you know, their body is formed. You can't go back and grow another leg, but you can change your behavior to adjust. So you also have a level of you can change the magnitude of how much you express the genetic information that you have. And then there's behavioral and physical changes that experience can affect. So remember, this is just um, a photo of my parents' dog, Tulip, and she's out on Halloween. And this is a real picture. This is not just fabricated from a nightmare. Um, and that to her is super scary. It's actually really scary to me. Uh, but imagine if it was a puppy and that's a child. If the dog's body language looks like her body language, then in her mind, it's that scary. And so it's, I just want to put this in to remind everyone that the dog dictates and decides what they learn from a situation. I can only look at their body language and then decide how they feel about it. I'm not afraid of children, so it might be hard for me to empathize, but if the dog is doing this, 
they're that afraid of it. And so really at the end of the day, you have to look at that individual dog to decide how they are perceiving the environment. And I might have the best of intentions, but the dog will decide the association. So you have to watch their body language while you're working. So in this, these are some really early sort of four week old, three week old puppies and they're meeting a dog. So the first dogs they meet have to be really solid dogs who like puppies. You don't want dogs that are um, pushing the puppies around. Remember, they do figure things out, but also in the wild dogs do kill each other. So you have, we're really, we're not just, you know, there's some idea that maybe because it's natural, it's just good. We get to decide how we're going to use the information we know to get what we want behaviorally out of our dogs. If I wanted to raise a dog naturally, then they can't be on leash. They have to be outside. They have to have not back, no vaccines. You know, there's a lot of things that we don't do because we know better. And I think behavior is starting to catch up with some of that. Dogs do know how to figure out their, um, their problems by themselves, but oftentimes that will include serious damage to another dog or a puppy. So overall as kind of the outside forces watching this we get to decide what kind of dog you want to have in your household and what kind of dog you want to bring out into the world and you can use some of these things to help kind of guide you on your path for that so remember they learn who belongs in their in their um, socialization period and they need feedback for some of their innate behaviors it's really important to note that the type of feedback does not have to be negative. So dogs do not need to receive corrections in order to learn how to interact with other dogs. That is something that they can do. But remember when they learn that, they now give those. So they can give them at whatever intensity they were received. It's something that they learn at that age. They could be scared at that age. They can learn that other dogs are dangerous at that age. It can add stress to those puppies and change and kind of shift their development like kind of in a spiral. They also have the same capabilities to learn that we're in an extremely cooperative um, group of dogs that in this particular group of dogs is not super competitive and snarky, but instead very patient and cooperative. And that will turn on in the dog, this other behavior, which is get ready for a life of, of intense cooperation with other dogs. So it's not this all or nothing where you have, okay, well, these dogs need to have this interaction so they know how to interact with their dogs. Behavior is flexible and there are many ways for dogs to interact with each other. It doesn't all have to be just no, no, no. And you know that from working with other people. You don't have to constantly say no. You can also say, I like that you did that both ways will shape behavior and the type of input that the dog gets will start to change how they develop and the behaviors they show in the future. So this goes for rough puppy play. This goes for their normal reactions. This goes for taking bones away from other dogs. All of those behaviors, you can decide how you would like the puppy to learn those things. And that kind of leads us into this, this idea is that in a way, and it's maybe not the way that they have museums and art museums, but animals have a type of culture. They have information that's passed on from adults to the pups. One of the, the things that has happened for sure with our dogs is that we have disrupted some of that pathway where the adult mother might not have a very nurturing mother and not, might not have behavior she can pass down to her pups. We implement a lot of our personal culture into the dog's puppyhood and what they develop but in other animals, it's found that there's sort of this, this cultural information that's passed on by elders is actually very important and that the more disrupted it gets, the more aggressive it gets. So for elephants, if elephants are, are, have their elders killed from poachers and they start to develop into adolescents, they are aggressive, they're rageful, they attack people, they attack rhinoceroses, they don't have the, the, the behaviors and the, the, the cultural um, uh, kind of um, nurturing that, that the elders per, kind of provided for them and ways for them to deal with some of their grief or their stress or their anger. They don't have that and so they express the behavior right away. And to some degree, I believe that we might see that in dogs as well, where we have disrupted some of the natural nurturing of the mothers. The mothers are stressed. Um, we, have, we have a whole sort of generation of dogs that are being born who don't have the best environment 
available to them. Or the training techniques, once they're born, are so strange that you develop behavior problems. So they're not necessarily things that really will draw out the best behaviors for our dogs in terms of being um, happy citizens in a world full of people. So it's important to know that. There are situations where um, older wolves were killed from a, um, from a wolf pack and the family was then just left with the pups. Well, the pups had never really learned how to hunt the animals that are harder to hunt, that the parents knew how to hunt. They can only do that through observation and being taught through the culture of the, the elders. And when that was gone, they stopped hunting those and those wolves for the first time moved on to domestic animals. So there's information that's really important that is actually passed on through demonstration. And it's important to remember, it doesn't mean that if you have a dog who doesn't like puppies, that they're going to be a good teacher. Very few dogs were raised in a group of dogs or with other puppies or with a nurturing mother. And so really understand some of those cultural behaviors that they needed feedback themselves to sort of develop. And so they don't make good teachers because there's been disruption in that communication and, and that um, what would be sort of a natural dog behavior. Uh, a lot of those things take maintenance and they also take um, learning through observation. You know for sure dogs, a lot of dogs can learn that somehow you open the door by touching something around the doorknob. And so they might jump up and kind of push that area. Maybe they don't get that you turn it, but they are learning through observation. So there were studies done with primates and newborns, including humans, that they require social interactions for normal development. So that means that if you take any social animal and you put in isolation, you stop a feedback loop, which is needed to maintain their social behavior. And also in humans, it turns out some of their impulse control. So people who have been in solitary confinement for longer periods of time are having a harder time with impulse control because the ongoing experiences are not maintaining the behavior and it's not fully understood what's happening but it's probably something that happens to our long-term shelter dogs and it's something to consider that that those dogs need more human contact in order to slow down the progression and i really think of it more as a type of isolation for those dogs that's why we see dogs that have more issues and the dogs who have the hardest time with it are the dogs who are the most um they're usually very sweet dogs that start to develop cage sort of um, barrier frustration and reactivity and to the point where they can be chasing imaginary things. That's something that happens as they're no longer having this ongoing experience to um, maintain the behaviors and the brain health. At the same time, behavior is super resilient. It's all, it's not all just bad news that they're always on this like path and you can barely keep up with it. Um, Extra nurturing goes a long ways. If you have puppies, nurturing was one of the most effective ways to kind of um, build resilient and rat pups. And um, in studies with rats, even after they're, they're adults, let's say they miss some of those early stages of life, if they have extra enrichment, then their behavior, they were able to become more resilient and they were able to become really smarter. If you had two populations of rats, one which were crazy awesome at running a rat maze, they were genetically selected to run that rat maze. And then we have these other rats who were the worst at running the rat maze and we just kept breeding them and kept breeding them until we have um, like super rats and then the sub super rats. So these guys are not able to run the maze at all. Well, the environment had a huge impact when they were in adolescence in adulthood on developing their skills. So I could take the rats from the really poor group of rats who were very bad at running the maze, and I would take those and give them an amazing environment with lots of enrichment. So they would develop their neurons to be able to go up and down, remember direction and space. Well, those rats now would run as well as the rats who were the super rats. So the environment after they're born, it's not just a, a closed book and you, maybe you have a dog who had a bad environment. Um, there's still a lot that can be done after that. At the same time, if you have had a negative association formed, let's say they had one very scary vet um, experience, um, I, what I want to do now is go back after a, a brief, I want them to relax, to be de-stressed so that I don't sensitize by sending them right back into the vet. Um, and then I want to change 
that association. Remember that now the association has been formed, those are important for survival. So the, the kind of the shadow of that is never going to be gone. It's created a very strong pathway. But what I can do is I can change their coping behaviors. I can make them feel they have control over those interactions and that will reduce their anxiety and their stress. So let's say their brain says there is a problem here, but look at the behaviors you have to deal with this. And I try to work on the association as much as possible. A big aspect of that is often giving the animal some control over their bedding procedure after they've had a really bad um, situation. As time goes on, it's been discovered that enrichment and their environment have a huge impact on the health of an organism. So that's nutritional, foraging, feeding, their physical, their social, all of those things really, they build the animal. And it's something that's even being used more and more working with human mental illness is that environmental enrichment stimulates the brain in a way that the brain was designed to be stimulated. So the motor patterns that are in there, the ways that they, um, they compare information, the way that they engage in the world, those are natural. They have, there has been, again, billions of years have gone into making the scaffolding and it really does best in an environment that it was designed for. So you have some of the, the being able to access your natural behaviors, being able to access your natural intellect, um, and then your, your social enrichment, the things that you need really to give and take from other species in your area. So this is our, our section on the influence of genetics and we'll look at epigenetics so well. Um, so the selection is sort of who reproduces and who doesn't, which has changed in the past hundred years. All of us are a product of the past environment. Um, you can't possibly be a product of the future environment because time works in a, in a fashion where the past creates the, um, the scenario that will allow those genetics to be successful. And then some of the effects that those, that genetics we know have on behavior. So first it's important to go into what does heritable mean? So DNA codes for a lot of things and some of those are things that are able to be passed on through a code. And again, that system started just like behavior in a very, very simple um, kind of um, single celled organism where information could be coded and information that was coded that was useful is passed on to the next generation. And from here we have the beginning of evolution and, and what kind of things can be coded for, how those things can be affected. Anything that can occur, that can be passed on, and we're just starting to uncover some of this, that's beneficial and improves the biological fitness or the ability of the organism to reproduce, those are the things that can survive into the future and sort of a race from the past to the future and at any point the race can end for any organism and it's important to remember that behavior is not something that was somehow free of this and i think early on because of the way that people think we really wanted to have sort of free will and it's not that everything you do is coded in genetics it's that it influences it behavior itself can be selected for as a trait if you have an animal who's fearful of snakes and there are poisonous snakes, it's very advantageous for some aspect of that to give them a little boost that outcompetes everybody else who does not have a fear of snakes. And this is a look at some of the things, the genes and the environment, and it's adapted from, um, there's a link down here so you can see the original, um, the original diagram. So in the center we have the brain. So the brain produces behavior and these green lights are, or these green arrows are sort of the immediate effects and the red arrows are the immediate feedback. So your brain creates the behavior, your behavior goes to your social interactions, the types of social interactions you have change your behavior and those in turn change your brain structure, how you record it. At the same time, at the very bottom you have genetics. The genetics code and, and, and really influence how your brain is formed. Your brain though at the same time can go back and change the way that the genetics are being expressed. So now we have, that's the center diagram here. So now we have a couple and we'll go over this again when we get down to it a little bit more. That's mostly what we've been talking about right now is how your environment affects your behavior, affects your neurology, and now we're just tying in the genetics. So you also have your social interactions can um, 
go, we'll go to the weight, the weight arrows here. So those will affect the evolution of the animal. And that evolution, who's selected for and who's not, will change the genetic pool of who's in the future. And then that will, again, now that those new behaviors are selected for, they influence the brain, they influence the behavior, they influence the social interactions, and then all the way back down. The last two kind of wings we haven't touched are epigenetics and development. The development we already talked about briefly, which is, let's look, start with genetics. Genetics has its role on development, the different things that are affected at different time, but also in this period of time, your social interactions, let's say with your parent, um, stress they're under, those will also have a role in development. And that will have this other arrow going back to the brain. So your development is impacted not just by your genetics, but also by the external environment and your and social interactions are involved in that. So selection essentially is just who makes it into the future. And nowadays for most of our dogs, we have selected who makes it in the future. And in some aspects, we are not as wise as nature was. We really select for maybe visual appearances for those dogs. And although those dogs have exploded sort of in their, and the number of them in the present, many of them will not make it into the future for either the, the problem that we have overpopulation, um, that they can't physically breed, which is a problem for some dogs. Um, the um, French bulldogs and things, there's a lot of dogs who their body really is, they would not, no longer be able to reproduce without some help because of the way that we've bred their bodies. Um, we've also reduced diversity. So this happens, it would happen naturally sort of in a bottleneck scenario where you say, okay, we're just going to, you know, only two animals made it to the island. That's the, the future. The entire generation of that species now is those genetics. Well, we've done a very similar thing with each line of breed that we select for. They're very, very similar and they often share very similar genetic flaws. So things like maybe golden retrievers, they might have some some things in their lineage that make it a little bit more prone to develop cancer. There's things like that that we know run in lines and that are heritable for those dogs. Originally, our dogs were really bred for their behavior, so they needed to be able to do something. Over time, we began to select for dogs that were more and more how they look. So that's really where, in some ways, it's not that it was... Um, they still are quite successful as a species, so they still are adjusting to how our culture is changing, but in some ways they're not as healthy physically as the dogs who are really purpose-driven. Um, those dogs needed to be to not die of cancer. They didn't have vets, so they need to be strong in a lot of ways. Um, dogs that had bad hips or um, that type of thing that were too large and had neck issues and spine issues um, too long, those dogs didn't make it. So as we started to select for dogs that were more um, sort of form and not function, we start to have more physical ailments associated with those lines. Um, and not to say that those dogs are not still seriously successful in terms of their numbers in the population, but it their overall physical well-being in some um, cases has actually taken a bit of a hit and they can't do things like go outside when it's hot or walk for long distances or they might suffer from things like chronic back pain and that type of thing. So this is an example of, of that. So what happened is with the Kelpie of Australia, which is this working dog who um, works on farms to herd, is that they wanted to see what genetic influence has happened when they diverge the Kelpie from a good working dog into a bad working dog. And, and, and essentially, the poor and the good working dog was a poor dog was a show dog who had been selected for what they look like. A good dog was a farm dog who was still selected for how they performed on the farm. So they took those dogs and they looked at their genetics. And what they did is they looked for places where they shared, but also where they did not share. So they found a few places where they consistently, all of them, did not share. And what they found is that on chromosome eight, there was a locus which, which could be related to behavioral excitability, how quickly they become excited over stimulus. And there was another one which related to pain perception on chromosome 30. 
and so those chromosomes they really already they've already um, genetically um, documented all the DNA in the boxer and some other breeds and so they can go back and look at what those things are really known for and so essentially what they were able to find that the biggest predictor of a good working dog was they had a reduced pain perception and memory of fear formation so that in itself was such a small thing but the effects of not having fear and not having pain is that these dogs could work intensely and bravely plus the excitability um, it was actually not a suite of like 50 genetic differences but maybe two and that those would have this incredible cascade that changed the the behavioral profile of these working kelpies. So they actually found the same thing when they looked at, at working labs. They found that the labs um, that were from the US had reduced pain perception and um, they found that the ones in Australia were a slightly more pain um, um, perceptive. So a lot of what we have now are dogs where they're, they're really a fish out of water. They were breeds that were designed for something and then we put them in an environment that is not suitable for what they were really created for. And it doesn't mean that if you get a border collie that they can't live in a home without being a herding dog, um, but it could be that it will make it more difficult because of the history of the border collie. You might have a dog who was really designed to do something like run for 12 hours a day and to be thinking and constantly sort of engaged. So it's important um, that you remember there are no really bad dogs. The environment is what makes us perceive whether it's a good dog or not. So when you get these puppies in, they're designed for some environment and it might not be the one they ended up in. So there's another interesting um, situation that happened in Russia where they had fur foxes and they would breed those foxes um, and they started to notice some differences and so a scientist there decided to just select for the foxes that were tame. At the same time they selected for the, tox the foxes who were very fearful. And there was a similar experiment on pointers in the in the states as well. But what they found with the foxes is that as they selected for, um, sorry, the pointer, the pointer study was just that they selected for fearful pointers. Um, in the fox study, it's, it stands out because they just selected for these tame foxes, but along with that tameness, when they were selecting for it, there became this suite of traits that was sort of pulled along with it because the tameness, the behavior trait, in order to affect that when they were selecting for it, they were actually selecting for much further up in development. And that early selection, those, those differences, started to change some phys physical features in the fox over time. So the tame foxes actually became really, in the end, they, they were quite a bit like a small dog. They had floppy ears and curly tails and they had patches um, where the fearful fox was, um, just the opposite. He was more fearful and um, and and they they really looked at so genetics could play such a huge role in fear and perception for a dog. So there are some behaviors that we know have a huge um, sort of a, 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 genetics have a large influence on. So one of those are the flank sucking in Dobermans. And a lot of these behaviors actually were normal behaviors that for some reason or another have been hyper um, sort of selected for, hyper um, exhibited in that individual. And sometimes anxiety can have a role on how valuable those behaviors are impulsiveness in the Malinois, and then just as I was kind of referring to earlier, the fearful German short hair pointers. So these are just very, very scared German short hair pointers that were um, bred for us in a small group. And, um, and they are more fearful of new stimuli, all of the individuals that are within that genetic family. And, um, and that's the same thing that we see in a lot of our dogs that were bred for certain behavior traits that genetics do influence behavior. It in no way says that now because a dog is a certain breed, they have those things. It's really important to note that there's no 
scientific basis for breed discrimination in that way, um, that those dogs are born with a certain number of traits, how they use them and what happens and who that individual is can still be just the luck of the draw with cards and, um, and, and can still be largely influenced by the environment. So all of the social animals have a big ability to do cooperation. So in, um, in dogs, there's actually sort of a, what in humans would be sort of a syndrome, is that there is a, a, a region of the brain that can be affected that causes hypersociability. And dogs share that, um, that change that humans have. So in humans, it's sort of a syndrome. You're super, you're hypersocial. In dogs, I imagine it's like the golden retriever. <laughs> you're hypersocial. Um, but it's above average sort of is what's happening. And perhaps in the dog, it was highly desirable in some situations, or we have selected for it at this point in time. Um, and um, where in the past, actually, we probably did not select highly for hypersociability. Um, many dogs' jobs early on were to be sort of guardians of land or homes or families. Another super interesting example is the metal vole. So this is a monogamous mouse, or um, kind of a, uh, like a little mouse species with a short dock tail. Um, and there's two versions. One of them is highly monogamous and the other is promiscuous. So what they did is they took these two and they've been doing experiments with these two species side by side for a long time. And what they've been able to find is that oxytocin and vasopressin play a major role in indicating and regulating that pair bond. So if you give what would be a monogamous species a blocker of those, they don't pair bond with their mate. And the other way around, if you take the bull who's promiscuous and you give him a dose of that, then he will pair bond. And so a very simple kind of genetic switch is able to go on and off and make these individuals either form pair bonds. And the pair bonds are important in environments where they need both individuals raising the young. And in other, in other situations, maybe food is too scarce and you really want them to separate afterwards, then you don't have that. And you have the promiscuous species where the male is simply trying to get as much of his genetics in the future as possible. And the female is trying to raise her pups with the least amount of competition. So just recently, um, there was a study that came out showing that oxytocin and vasopressin also seem to have a place in looking at aggression in the domestic dog. So they compared, um, and this is the link to the study so that you can look it up, they really compared oxytocin levels and vasopressin levels in pet dogs. And they looked at assistant dogs and they looked at um, head friendly and they were really bred for this friendly non-aggressive temperament. Um, and they looked at dogs that might have other um, sort of fears or reactivity. And what they found was that just like in the voles, there was a difference that was um, um, highly um, suggestive that these things do play a role in shaping social behavior in the dog. And um, and I think really as the next decade rolls out, we'll be able to have a better understanding of how the chemicals that affect behavior can be manipulated to help improve animal welfare for our dogs. So let's say we have dogs that have missed opportunities. Some of those dogs that you might categorize into that group are the puppy mill dogs that are adults, even the puppies can have it, hoarding dogs from hoarding cases, bottle babies and mothers who are very stressed in utero. So they already have what would be sort of a strike against them. They are gonna have to fight the current a little bit. Um, some of them are genetically so incredible that they're able to do that without difficulty. And other ones may need a little bit of stress from whoever their guard or a little help from whoever their guardian might be. So we know that with impoverished animals, um, let's say the, mat, the, raise, um, the maze running rats, that the enrichment in their environment drastically affected their performance in the maze. And the same thing is if I took a rat, I decreased their enrichment, well then those rats, um, they had incredible decrease in their ability to run those mazes. So it's the same sort of situation where if you have an impoverished animal, you have increased anxiety and depression, it's now 
just really just starting to be very apparent that animals do not develop normally without and with what we call enrichment, which is actually more a baseline of what they should be um, interacting with on a daily basis. Their brains were designed for that type of interaction. Anything less than that is sort of below baseline. Um, and we, we call it enrichment because it's adding something from where we are. But to the dog, it's really you're just trying to get back up to where normal is sort of for them. So in realizing how important enrichment is in changing the processing of that dog and the little behaviors that they have to, in order to deal with aggression, anxiety, and depression, uh, that's something that's really just starting to be understood in canines. So our last section will be epigenetics. And this is something that um, when I was in school for animal behavior, we didn't actually know about epigenetics. This kind of came later and it came as like a huge surprise to me. Um, and so I'm going to share what I know about that with you. So environmental responsiveness is something that we already know is so important. What if your DNA wasn't just set and your mom has it and then she's going to give it to you and there's nothing you can do about it in, in between there? What if there were things that I could say, all right, well, was it really cold out or was it really hot out? And in the environment my mother was in and is there anything that she could do to help boost her puppy's ability to be able to deal with that and we know now that some animals like flatworms might be able to do just that they might be able to give environmental information in a way to help increase the fitness of their offspring so it's important to note that most of these changes are not on off switch it's more like a dimmer light switch and it's really important to remember that not all epigenetic changes actually affect your offspring those what affects your offspring are things that make it into the gametes that are also um the little there's i'll show you there's little tags that kind of go on the dna that are read by the the pups from their mom that their mom their mom's body put on the dna but there's others that don't do that, that are not passed on, that really affect your particular health at that time. So these epigenetic changes have behavioral and physical effects on organisms. So what happens, and we already had a look at DNA, but now you'll see there's this little added um, messenger, and that's the methyl group. And there turns out to be several types of messengers, um, but this is, this is one of them, and this is one that we'll look at mostly because there's, there's a lot of research on this one. So the DNA is this long purple strand, and information from the environment can tag itself onto different parts of the DNA that will, will start to change how that DNA is read or how frequently it might be read. So let's say you have a DNA methylation, a methyl group goes down, it can tag and activate or can rep repress, depending on where it goes and what it's doing, a gene. That particular gene could be a gene for color, it could be a gene for um, something behaviorally, um, for whatever whatever it was coded for, now it's being affected. And it's being affected by things that are in the environment that you might eat, the drugs, your age, your diet, things that you're exposed to. There's things that clean up your methyl groups. If those are affected, then, then the same thing. You're gonna have more kind of messengers that are going back and forth through time. And if you wanna read more about that, there's a link down here that will talk just about epigenetics because it's, it's truly a fascinating um, area. So epigenetics are, really explain some of the differences that we see, let's say, between twins. Twins are super similar in that they share the same DNA, but if you look at these two twins on the top, they are slightly different. That is because the DNA was expressed slightly differently. It's not that they are exact copies of each other. Their DNA is the same, but the way that you read it and express it creates subtle differences in the brain and physically. So another amazing thing is that animals are able to use epigenetics in order to adjust to their environment and they do so readily. Some animals are able to change their sex based on the environment. So some fish are able to um, recognize sort of their social position in the other fish and be able to change their sex maybe from a female to a male so that they can improve their reproduction strategy. Um, 
but they can decide how the information is going to be used. So for bees, um, the royal jelly that's secreted from the glands and the heads of the worker bees is different than what they feed to a regular worker bee. And the larvae that they feed it to, although they are completely identical genetically, they are only fed this protein, those will start to change. Their different genes are turned on in the, in the bees, the worker bees, larva, that are fed the royal jelly. And so now they turn into a queen and the queens have a totally different behavior strategy than the worker bee. The worker bee is cooperate, work together, make, get food, feed the babies, go on, on, on hunts to find nectar and pollen. So now you get, because you fed them something else, it turns on some other genes and these queens have an instinct to kill other queens. They make a communication sound to their workers and they go on a mating flight, which is unheard of obviously for the worker bee. So the royal jelly actually, it doesn't turn something on, it acts as an off switch for DNMT3 and this gene codes for a group of enzymes that silence that cascade of changes. So what's really important there, and this happens a lot, a very, very important function, which is reproduction, is often not turned on it's more, it would be silenced. So that if there was ever a genetic problem, your fail safe is that that royal jelly didn't, uh, they didn't get it, they would be able to perform their normal functions. So here we have another look, and this is a behavior, um, behavioral and physical look at some mice. And this was a really nice study that was done where they took some mice and they gave all of the, the the first generation, all the mothers had PBA, and that's something that would sort of cause some damage, sort of methylation to some of their genes. So on top of, on top of that, they gave half of the mothers a supplement, a food supplement of folic acid. When they did that, they changed epigenetic, um, they sort of reverse some of the epigenetic damage that was done to the mothers. So here we have the two lines. We have the yellow mouse. The yellow mouse was actually the, the mother that was formed PBA. And then this brown mouse was going to be a yellow mouse, but that mother also had the folic acid. So what happens is with the damage, they got pale um, mice, which were, that's why they're yellow. And then they were obese. They had two sort of problems that resulted from, from the mothers eating this PBA. But when they were able to give them a folic acid, it reversed the damage. And so what it showed was that the diet that they were able to have was able to, um, the supplements were able to reverse some of the damage that was done with the PBA. So another really interesting, and this is, this is a generational, sort of cross-generational, the things that they eat, the way that it can affect the mothers. Um, so starvation and grandparents for the Dutch famine. Um, when the grandparents were very, very hungry, it turned on all these genetic markers that made it far more likely that their grandchildren would be obese because if your grandparents are really hungry, you better make sure that you don't waste any calories and diabetes, which are a problem with, with um, processing food in the grandchildren. And so that was one of the early ones that they were able to kind of discern in people that these multi-generational effects of epigenetics could take place. So here's another look at how the physical exposure might have sort of a cultural um, slide down the generations. So we have a mother who was exposed to BPA, which is biphenyl A, and then we have her pups. So she was exposed and then her pups were born um, and they were actually raised perfectly normally with no exposure. And then they had pups and they looked at those pups to see if they were abnormal in any way. And what they found is that the grandchildren of the pups who were born to BPA had decreased vocalization and maternal care. So what that shows us is that the early exposure to the parents when they looked had affected how the grandchildren eventually were um, phenotypically, behaviorally. So behaviorally, these baby mice are not vocalizing. They're, they're quiet. 
and and what that means actually when they looked at what was causing this is that less vocalization meant that they didn't get as much nurturing from the mothers and that the mothers who were exposed to BPA possibly those mothers if it was having an effect on vocalization they were not nurturing their pups and their pups were not nurturing the next generation and so this early exposure changed the nurturing of the mothers which we know is one of the most important aspects to developing resistance um, from the rat studies um, and and therefore affected the resilience of their pups in the future and here's the rat pup study that we keep referring to so the rat pups that received the high or low nurturing from their mothers, they develop changes that affect their response to stress later in life. So if your mother was very sweet and, and loving with you, it's not that they, they kind of spoil you and you're, more, and you're a baby when you grow up. You're actually, you're like the tough rat when you grow up. You're able to deal with stress better than if you weren't. And that's kind of actually the opposite of how we think of it culturally. But this is, this is scientifically what actually happens. Um, and, and it makes, it does make sense, obviously, um, even with humans. So when those pups became, when the female pups become mothers themselves, the ones that received the highest quality of care when they were pups, those became the most nurturing mothers. And the ones that became the lowest became the lowest nurturing mothers. So what's starting to happen is that epigenetics is affecting behavior. Remember the chart we saw? The epigenetic changes are changing the behavior and that's sort of starting this cultural cascade where now mothers aren't nurturing and so their, their pups aren't gonna nurture and so they're not gonna nurture and it's just, it kind of brings down these pups that are highly sensitive to stress and live in a dangerous world. And it takes a little while for them to recover from that type of, um, of turn. It's important to remember that transmission comes from the mother, but it also comes through the DNA of the sperm. So the males can also transmit sex, the stress from their gametes. And, in, and it's important, I think, in this is that the, in the dogs, the animals, they really are trying to prepare. These things exist for a reason and have existed for a reason for billions of years because they do something. They make you more responsive to environmental changes. So in flatworms, they were able to kind of, they were able to turn on genes that maybe made them more sensitive or, or um, to heat or to cold. And then for dogs, behavioral changes that might make them ease, faster to get away from something that's dangerous in a perceived very dangerous world or more resilient. And so that you don't waste your time trying to run away from things. But they can get it wrong. Things change really fast in the world that we live in. So a very stressed um, mother can have her pups be born into a completely safe world and you're still going to see some of those signs. So some of the signs that we see are um, increased biting and mouthing, um, decreased inhibition, um, decreased handling and tolerance, decreased resilience to stress, which is the one that we know from the rat studies, increased fear and anxiety, increase in aggression to their same species, considering that you really don't want to work together as much if you're under a ton of stress. It's kind of every man for himself. And hyperarousal is also a possibility. So in our dogs, um, we know that social behavior is um, something that can be facilitated through methylation. Um, it seemed to be something that was also dependent on the dog's sex. Um, there was the early studies, and I'll have a slide that, that goes over all of the references later. The behavior was in border collies, and serotonin has now been shown to be an agent in methylation. And serotonin is, is um, something that we often use for dogs who maybe have anxiety, um, aggression, type anxiety. Um, and now it's been shown that the levels of that might have a further cascade in the expression of the genetics the dog already has. And I have a link to that as well. So let's say all that has already happened. And that just gives you an idea of the layers of things that can happen to an individual dog that produce the behavior that they're in. And that we're kind of, we're gonna use what we know now, which is gonna change in the next five years to try to help the dog get to the best place they can be. So I know stress for almost all of our shelter dogs needs to be lowered in order to help them have a better outcome. 
stress is important in order for animals to be successful, but the most important part is the nurturing and that they're successful and in a good state of mind. I need to know what the species specific behavior is so that I know when things are off and I can start training another response to them. So how rough should puppies play? They, I don't want to see punctures, you know, that's, that's too, that's not, that wouldn't be normal, but it can certainly be turned on. And in other things like foxes, it's, it, it's, it's a high enough problem that foxes actually kill each other early on, even before they leave the den. So those types of behaviors exist to some degree in dogs and under a ton of stress, they might actually resort to things like siblicide. So I've seen it happen in very young dogs that are under four weeks, but you have to know, is that typical behavior for them? And what can I do about that? Make sure that you do physical touch. So touch combined with food, um, warmth, um, that type of thing so that they really start to experience that touch is a good thing. Make sure they have that feedback. And remember that I'm really, in order to get the best out of these dogs, I'm minimizing the punishers in the environment and maximize your positive reinforcement. They will do better and it will turn on better behavior if they feel they're in a safe environment where there's not things they have to avoid around them. So punishment can, it's, there's a lot of kind of looking at how that stress affects dogs. And I think we have enough information to be able to see that if they're in a hostile environment where they need to actively avoid or stop doing something because it's going to have more side effects down the road. If you're in doubt and you see um, some behavior that's not typical or species typical for that age group, don't hesitate to, to contact a veterinary behaviorist. They have a very good idea of what would be normal in that age and when to intervene. And it's now thought probably early intervention is a great idea. Why wait? You want to get in there when you first have a hint of it and then and help your dog out. At the same time, if it's, if it's a more minor problem, training with from a certified trainer from someone who uses force free techniques can also be something if they're if they're educated in how to work with behavior and oftentimes um they'll work together so that if if you go to somebody and they're like yes this is a serious problem everyone on the whole team will be connected so that that dog gets the best help possible and remember the biggest thing is that your idea is that I want this animal to have the behaviors to navigate life who they are, and I want to provide them with the best version of life training. I want them to think that, the, that their world is super safe so that I can utilize these, all of these um, billions of years of evolution to really harness who I want that dog to become and make them believe they're in a safe world, so that in a healthy world, so that they turn on everything that I want them to turn on and practice the behavior I want them to practice. If you have a mom who comes into the shelter, and here's a couple pictures of some stressed out pregnant moms, and then a, a mother with a million babies inside her, nutrition does matter. And, and maternal stress does matter. So if they come into the shelter, I wanna make sure just like with those, the rats where there was a yellow rat and a brown rat, the mothers who had a good nutrition were able to turn off some of the, the methylation in the DNA of things that were being affected. And so nutrition is another very important aspect of, of um, intervention for a mother. If you get the mothers and they're coming into the shelter to get them out of the shelter to a foster home, where they can be by themselves or a, like a visiting room for your shelter or some other quiet room where they're not gonna get a lot of work. If you have bottle babies, if I can get them to a, fast, a foster mother, so someone, uh, uh, either another cat or a dog to be able to have um, the nurturing aspect that I know is important. If you have to raise them by hand, lots of petting, lots of grooming, you really are trying to mimic all of the parental care that the mother would be giving. And you can mimic some of that with this, is a, a damp towel, as a tongue. Uh, and it's the physical sensation that's really important there. If you're adopting, consider the stress of the father and the mother. If you're buying a puppy, you definitely don't want puppy mill dogs. Um, they're under a lot of physiological stress, heat stress, cold stress, food stress, um, lack of enrichment stress. Those puppies will always have the odds set against them. Um, and really plan on, no matter who they are and who you choose to take on as a project, to start their training and give them 
kind of the best, I just call it the best world, give them the best possible vision of the world by making sure every interaction they have is a positive. And the whole goal to that is to minimize their interactions that are negative and maximize what they view as successful interactions. And that will promote behaviors that are conducive to that new sort of this, this version of life that I've given them. So here we have the original diagram and you can kind of see how um, genetics, we talked about this, genetics affects the brain, this green arrow going up, and then this green arrow going to individual behavior. The brain affects your individual behavior. Your individual behavior will affect your social interactions. And then your social interactions go in three, they go actually in four different places. They immediately affect your behavior. And then a little bit of time goes by, they affect the development. They affect your epigenetic changes. So um, high-ranking individuals in a group of primates, like baboons, um, have lower levels of stress than the, the lower-ranking individuals. And so lower-ranking individuals are going to have offspring that are more sensitive and possibly more aggressive based on how stressed out their parents were, because they know that they're going to need to be fighting a little bit harder to be able to get what might come naturally to somebody who's... Um, not in that in that stressful situation. So it affects your epigenetics and it affects overall the evolution of that species based on who survives and who doesn't. And all of those things play together. So I think um, the bigger picture here is that it was really thought at some point that behavior is just in the brain. But I think this kind of gives you this idea that behavior is in the body and it's in the environment, it's in the past and it's with who, around, with who you're with. And it doesn't just stop. You don't just have your behavior on Monday and it's the same behavior on Friday. It continues to evolve and change as you do things to it. There are a lot of studies that are showing now that even something in humans like exercise will start to turn on genes that were not there. And not like five genes, like a thousand genes. So the way that you are in your environment really changes who you are. If I start exercising today, every day, and I didn't before, in six months, I'm expressing my genetics in a completely different way than I was today. So sort of a review, the, we looked at the role of behavior. Um, the goal of that behavior is to propel, kind of propel them through time in the most successful way possible. Um, the developmental stages, what would be sort of the sticky times for an animal to learn certain stimuli. And remember that it's not just a closed book and that it's done. Animals are always learning. And then the complicated um, influence that genes and epigenetics have to this never adjusting environment to the individual but also in some cases, changes that can be passed on to the offspring. And remember, epigenetics is both those things. It can change who the genetics of what you're expressing in your own body, and then some of those changes can also be passed on, but not all of those changes necessarily. Um, and so that's kind of a review for all of that. I think the last bit is to not feel that we're just at, at whim of the world, but there's things that we can do, the enrichment, the um, giving them a best version of life, physical exercise, social opportunities, a good healthy diet to maintain that damage, to make sure that they can, can keep um, the methylation from happening, um, that a poor diet starts to make the animal believe, again, biologically, that they're in a bad environment and they need to, t to make up for that. Um, teach them the behaviors they need to know to get overwhelmed. If you have a reactive dog, give them things that they know how to do to manage the world so that they don't have to live in fear. And so that's it. That's the, um, that's the end for this topic. And thank you for joining us.